Hey, what's up? So, Avalanche. Let's talk about it. What's, what's an avalanche? The snow comes down real fast, fierce, gains momentum. But I'm not talking about the natural disaster. Or if it's not really a disaster, I guess, if no one's around. But anyways, avalanche, what is it? You've heard about it. Now you're going to hear some more. It's an open source platform for launching decentralized finance applications, right? DeFi. That's what you want. Developers who build on Avalanche can easily create powerful, reliable, secure applications and custom blockchain networks with complex rule sets or build an existing private or public subnet, right? I think what you should do right now is stop what you're doing, even if it's listening to this podcast. Stop. Pull over. Go to the gas station if you need to. Go to a subway. There's a subway like everywhere. There's always a subway. All right. All right. There's always a Kroger. Just stop in a parking lot somewhere. Go to avalabs.org to learn more. All right. Stop. Go to avalabs. That's A V A Labs, L A B S dot org. Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Welcome to Hashing It Out, a podcast where we talk to the tech innovators behind blockchain infrastructure and decentralized networks. We dive into the weeds to get at why and how people build this technology and the problems they face along the way. Come listen and learn from the best in the business so you can join their ranks. Hey everybody, welcome back to Hashing It Out. For, for the first time on video, uh, this is going to be the first video content that we produce, which is going to be uh, an F2 panel of sorts. We did one of these before Mainnet launched on Ethereum 2.0. Uh, for the, for the About a year ago now, I think. Was it a year? Was it that long yeah. ago? Yeah. Holy cow. I it doesn't know. feel like that long at all. I mean, we're still under lockdown, weren't we? No, this is before. Wow. Okay. Well, we did one of these a long time ago, apparently. Uh, and on that one, we drank wine, and there was a wine tasting appropriate with it. So today, uh, we're doing some of us are doing the same, depending on the time zone. I'm drinking uh, 19 Crimes Cali Red. It has a picture of Snoop Dogg on it. Uh, and I will let others let the, let you know what they're potentially drinking or not drinking uh, as they introduce themselves. Jay, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jay. I'm drinking coffee from the local A&W. Um, uh, it's a little early for me. I don't have a problem drinking in the morning. I'm just like, I need coffee. Um, uh, my name is Jay. I've been in the space for a long time, as you, as many of you know. Um, I, you know, when I'm not doing this, I work uh, with Quantstamp, um, and we do security there. Um, yeah, and uh did a, I think what we were, we had done is we talked about ETH2 a few months back, um, as part of a meetup. And, um, it's good to like kind of keep talking about, uh, ETH2. And I do roughly monthly little, um, get together. So keep an eye on my Twitter and you can check that out. Cool. Excited to be here. We'll to put that in the description to make sure, try to, try to fit as many links as we can. Alicia's with us to take notes and make sure that, uh, we put the things in the description that we say we're going to. Greg, say what's up. Hey, hey. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm drinking water. It's like one and I got a lot of work to do today. <laughs> uh, also, yeah, just the last time I spilt wine all over my keyboard. So I don't want to go through another keyboard. Uh, to watch at least <laughs> as, as, as you were freaking out about your keyboard as someone was trying to like walk us through a wine tasting. Yeah. And Jay was, I told Jay, don't send me questions and gave me like the hardest question about c5 in which i had to google what c5 was <laughs> um but yeah uh excited and for those that don't know i'm cto and uh, one of the co-founders of chainsafe and we run and maintain the lodestar client which uh is running a full sync right now on mainnet we just aren't advising anybody to run a validator client as of today which is you know for the sake of it december 10th <laughs> awesome ben Hi, I'm Ben uh, Edgington. Um, got myself a Californian 
Malbec. Uh, it's uh, six o'clock in the evening here. I'm in the UK, so definitely wine o'clock. Um, and uh, I have been with Consensus for just over three years, working on Ethereum 2 uh, for most of that time before it was uh, Ethereum 2 and we, it was just sharding and uh, scalability, um, first in a research capacity, and I'm now product owner or product manager for our Teku ETH2 client, which uh, our sort of target market, our niche that we, we're carving out is is mostly amongst institutional stakers, but it's a perfectly fine uh, client to, to run at home. I've got one running uh, right now, earning me rewards, I hope, or better check. <laughs> That's part of the discussion that I'm going to bring up is is uh, a, few, a few of those things you just mentioned. And uh, I guess I, I'm Corey Petty. I work for Status, CSO Status. We, we run the Nimbus client, and um, me and Jay are part of the Hashing It Out podcast, and where we talk about generally anything decentralization, blockchain, um, whatever we really want to talk about that's interesting to us. We try and dig in as much as we can, and we're not very shy about being technical in any way. So uh, welcome to the show. It's basically us talking. And I'm going to kick off with uh, Ethereum 2 mainnet launched. So the beacon chain as of December 1st was officially. So like what happened was enough money in the Ethereum 1 deposit contract was deposited, which reached past a threshold, which launched the genesis block of the F2 beacon chain, which is the first phase of Ethereum 2.0, which is the effort of Ethereum to migrate to proof of stake and increase uh, or change the architecture so that the number of transactions uh, can rise drastically and the burden on any given validator is minimized. So there's a lot of other... Threatening it now. Yeah, threatening it now. <laughs> there's a lot of implications of this type of stuff. Uh, we can talk about some of it or not, but what I kind of wanted to talk about was like, now that it started, um, what do we expect? What has been our experience so far as people who develop and run validators? Uh, what are questions that people should be aware of or be asking um and what are the different client teams that's not fully representative here we don't there are more client teams that are running very good software um like what are we focusing on um as client teams as uh we we continue to develop and get ready for further phases of ethereum 2.0 so i'll kick off i'm running uh i'm running four validators myself on a single node which is something that I don't think a lot of people understand. A single node can run multiple validators, and there are consequences of that. Have you all experienced that so far when um, running support for the people who are running your software? Yeah, uh, it's interesting, this running multiple val validators per node thing. I think the very original concept was, you know, one CPU, one vote, which was, you know, going right back to Satoshi's vision that kind of got lost in proof of work. Um, and so you have one validator per per unit, but the, the, the devs were, were too cunning and we found ways to run multiple validators per node. So adding validators doesn't really add much workload to your, once you've got a beacon node running, you can add, we're, we're happily running 2000 plus validators per beacon node and it doesn't in, in, increase the load a great deal. So in, in that sense, I, I feel we kind of, missed a step on the vision of, of one CPU, one vote, but it, um, it it seems really hard to achieve that. So it's a, it's a decent compromise position because running a beacon node is, is pretty lightweight. So they can, you know, we can distribute and get the decentralization we want uh, in any case. That probably doesn't answer your question, Corey. But <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting, like, it, as of like, well, as today, just running a beacon node, the scale isn't an issue. Like running multiple validators doesn't increase the load on your machine very much, but it does have consequences, right? Like um, say I need to make an upgrade and I would like to, I need to restart my node or for some reason or other, I have a power outage. I need to restart my, my, my node goes offline. The amount of work that I miss while offline is directly proportional to how many validators I'm running on that single machine. And I was going to say, all of that sounds like a lot of slashing conditions. Just it's waiting. Not slashing, out. right? That's going to be. It's going to be um, the the amount of money you miss by providing 
quality attestations. And over a certain amount of time, if you're offline, you'll lose some of that money as well. But they're not nearly as severe as a slashing condition, which is what happens when you do something wrong, which is good. something I'm going to get into later, right? That's something that I really want to get into later because we've seen it already happen within the 10 days so far of people running clients. And what most of the people who are running clients right now should know what they're doing. Uh uh, Greg, do you have any like a, do you have any input on this in terms of like what yeah. you've experienced so far? Yeah, so from a client team perspective, um, we're in a bit of a unique kind of position. So for those who know, we're like a full TypeScript implementation, leveraging some assembly script stuff to you know get Wasm out there. Um, and because we're not, we don't have people actually like running validators. Um, now we run our own and I'll get into that in a second, but because we don't run our own validators, our support side's actually, uh, from our utility libraries. So, um, like the deposit UI that I'm assuming almost everybody used to deploy, like for instance, was using our browser BLS library. Um, and I believe also our SSD library last time I checked. Um, so the serialization library and the key generating libraries. Um, so you can generate. So like our focus was there working with like, you know, EF folks and Carl to ensure that like everything was operating correctly. So we, our support was like before it all launched, right? We were like helping make sure we're conforming and stuff. When it came to actually running the validators, um, you know, like we run right now, we're running a lighthouse setup. We're going to migrate to Lodestar once we're like confident and ready to get that going to show public, you know, we're good with that. Um, and some of the things that we've noticed that have been like interesting is especially with the upgrade stuff. So for instance, our upgrade biggest issues we running is actually our ETH one node falling out of sync. Um, and the ability for like, uh, you know, we run Geth, um, simply do that was our choice and we have another mind backup. Um, but you know, like it falls out of sync for, you know, what we ended up happening is our machine hit actually, uh, it, it we peaked on RAM. I mean, we ran out of RAM, so we had to do a hot swap and get that upgraded, which had some downtime. Um, and the biggest thing we found actually was like the geth node took too long to sync. Um, we had to fall back to like an Infura like service to actually get us up and going again. The beacon nodes synced pretty fast. So when it comes to actually, you know, needing to perform that upgrade, we found that to be really, really easy. We run a Docker setup and basically that allows like, it's quite literally Docker down docker pull and you pull the specific images and then docker back up those specific image names and we run that in one one command um and it's we're talking like seconds so i found the downtime with actually running validators is actually quite nice um it's it's not that bad uh the biggest issue we had we missed some attestations um during that period because you know our alerting services actually weren't set up correctly so we found out we weren't covering a certain edge case because there weren't logs that we found out after the fact that you know uh there's no Sorry, I might have got a phone call and might cut out, but there was no log actually being emitted saying like your validator missed an attestation because that's not something that's actually loggable and not something we can scrape off grep out of the logs into Datadog, which is our monitoring service. So that's something I'm working now with the Lighthouse guys is to like, how can we better, you know, figure that out and get like more verbose logging to know like, hey, this didn't work, you know, like your attestations aren't going through. I um, mean, that's kind of the biggest challenge right now that I'm going to probably assume people are having because from what I've found out, a lot of people are just, you know, on, you know, beacon chain or beacon scan or whatever, like just looking, you know, 100, you know, I'm like looking through the list. Did I miss anything in the last like hour? Um, Cause that's a bit, I think that's the biggest challenge right now. Right. And it's like, how do we handle that? I think yeah. there aren't enough, um, there, there aren't other better ways to, to notify that. Like I remember when I was first running um, an ETH1 um, mining node, like I would, try and parse out any like specific event logs just so I can kind of leave it and then come back to it and see what's going on. Um, but I, I think most people maybe they might know how to do that, but there's a good chance that they don't. Yeah. We've, we've got this in Teku. So you, it will, it knows when it should make an attestation and that attestation should show up on the, on the chain on chain within 32 slots, uh, which is six minutes. And if it doesn't, then we, we have metrics to, to track this and we can alert uh, on them through all these sort of uh, Prometheus and, and Grafana alerting. So it's, it, it's possible to do, uh, it's delayed, uh, of course, because, you know, you have to wait to see if it appears on chain and we can track the distance that our testations are included. So if they're included very quickly or they're delayed by a few slots, we can also track that met metric and that's a good indicator of the health of your node. Uh, if it's uh, short on memory or CPU, 
um, that that will increase. So let's take a step. That back actually. Here. I want to take a oh, step yeah, back. Go here ahead. Before, before we get to this conversation, uh, to keep this maybe as self-contained as possible, um, let's try and give a short overview. Like so. As a user, I would deposit 32F into the F1 uh, Beacon Chain deposit contract. After that gets accepted, I then have basically keys associated with uh, a validator on the F2 Beacon Chain, a, a completely new blockchain, but same asset. We'll talk, maybe we'll get into that later. Uh, but it's a different blockchain. It's burned on F1. Uh, that means like, okay, you have a validator on F2. Awesome. What is the responsibility of a single validator? What are they doing? And what are they trying to make sure they're doing correctly? Who would like to answer that? Greg, have at it. Um, yeah, I mean, like a validator is kind of dumb to some degree, right? Because, you know, all it's really doing is making a get request to the beacon node. And it's just saying, telling, asking the beacon node, like, am I, you know, for a set of information about the current state to know, am I supposed to sign something, right? Um whether that be an attestation or proposing a block. And those are the two main roles, right? It's a testing and proposing a block. Um, proposing block gives a higher reward than a testing. Um, and as we discussed earlier already, like a testing, missing attestations isn't the end of the world. You know, the slashing conditions come from, you know, not actually being able to propose these blocks, doing double spends and such like that. Or not double spend, but rather like a double proposal or whatever. Um, so the validators themselves are aren't doing a lot of the legwork, at least in my opinion, my point of view. Um, a lot of the legwork really relies on, is your beacon node able to to produce enough data so that, you know, every so how many seconds you're polling for that beacon node, the validator is polling that beacon node to know, is it ready to do something? Um, I, that's my, like, really distilled version of it. So you have this, you have this, you have this, you have this beacon node, right? Beacon node software that's running, that's gathering information from multiple sources. It's syncing with the other beacon node software in the network to make sure that they're understanding what's the information that's going on just within the beacon chain. And it's pulling information from Ethereum 1 to make sure that it's understanding uh, what validator set is currently alive. Like what, what is the active validator set uh, so that it can, it can perform appropriate randomness. Um, and doing that is a lot of network traffic. Eventually, it'll become more network traffic as we subdivide the networks into shards. Uh, and they have to then manage, switch, hop onto different sub-networks very, very quickly and manage the peers associated with all those different things. Later conversation. That's for, that's for another hash it out later on down the line. So I need to understand all of the network traffic across the different networks and make sure that uh, when the network wants me to do something, my beacon chain said, hey, validator, sign this message, propose this block with this information, etc. It does that and submits it to the network in a v hopefully reasonable amount of time that the, that the rest of the network can, can can attest to those things or make sure that I did them correctly, right? That's why what Ben was saying, as the number of validators, like the number of validators on any given node can scale really quickly because it's not doing a lot of work. It's just signing shit whenever it wants to, whenever it needs to. The real work is in the node software, keeping up with all the different network information, consuming it, putting it in the right place, keeping track of like all the things that have been done by the validators. So you don't redo it, and alerting when something is wrong. Is that Ben? Would you agree with with that summary? Yeah. So I mean, I see the work of the validators announcing to to the network. This is my view of the world. So we've got all these thousands of beacon chain nodes distributed across the world and they all have a slightly different view of the network they've all seen different uh, network traffic over a period of time and they're all slightly out of sync with each other and my validator periodically is called upon to say this is my view of the network and to sign off on it and is putting down the stake that gives you the, the right to uh, sign off on, on, on that and then that's broadcast to the network and you receive all the views from the rest of the network and then the beacon node can adjust its view of the world to bring it in line with everyone else's view of the world. And we need a, a majority of validators that are that agree, because if somebody wants to spoof a view of the world, so, you know, Corey wants to promote his own view of what the network looks like, then he needs to have um, a, a majority or at least a third of the network to uh, uh, achieve that. <laughs> it's getting crazy your end, Corey. <laughs> 
I'm going to press a little further on both of you. Can you further distill all of what uh, you said into a tweet length? And I will allow for up to uh, three tweets um, in that tweet length as if it was a thread. Go, Greg. Uh, I knew you were going to do that. Um, yeah, uh, I'd say like, here we go. Validator has two raw, two jobs, um, simply attesting to existing data, on-chain data, and proposing new blocks. Um, within these two scopes of work, they receive all their information from the beacon chain. They don't communicate to any external body except for the beacon chain that you, the beacon chain node, sorry, that you have uh, told it to communicate with. At that point, it's up to the beacon chain node to disseminate all the information, gather the network, uh, the other, communicate with all the other net peers on the network to give that information so a validator can pull the beacon chain node um, and know what to sign, when to sign, and submit that back to the beacon chain node to then be propagated throughout the network. That's really good. Ben? Uh, yeah, what, what Greg said. Um, <laughs> uh, validators propose a view of the network and either agree or disagree with each other. <laughs> that was a lot better. <laughs> that is certainly a tweet. Um, okay. Um, so uh, let's assume for a minute that uh, whoever is listening may be um, less familiar with um, with ETH2 than, than maybe they should or maybe than their experience or, or what have you. Um, there seems to, there, there's obviously this difference between, uh, uh, node, validator, uh, beacon node, um, uh, beacon chain contract. Where, what is the relationship between those four? Right. So uh, let me see about this. So Beacon Chain Contract runs on Ethereum 1, uh, and that is the, the register of all of the stakes that have been placed uh, so far um, in 32 ETH increments. So that's the, the source of truth for who's eligible to be a validator. The Beacon node contains all of the state of the Beacon Chain and is the point... Uh, of communication with the rest of the network. So beacon nodes talk to each other and they watch the deposit contract. And in order to watch the deposit contract, you need an Ethereum 1 node running, um, Geth or uh, Open Ethereum or Nethermind or whatever. And so really all that's doing in the current context of Ethereum 2 is providing uh, a view of the beacon contract, the, the deposit contract to Ethereum 2. So beacon nodes are uh, watching the deposit contracts. They're talking amongst each other. They're maintaining the state. And then hanging off each beacon node, you've got a number of validators which are um, periodically attesting to the state of the local beacon node and telling the network, this is my view uh, of, of what's happening on the network. Each validator has a private key associated with it. So when you deposit in the contract, you create a private key which is what's registered in the contract and that's also registered with your validator so that that ties the whole thing up um, and closes the circle so th those are your four components essentially perfect i think that provides a, a little more clarity for people so anyone can just be like um they can just if they if they want to run a uh, a beacon node they also need to run um an eth1 node for it to watch that and then they can go further and um, run validators as well. They'll need an ETH1 node from somewhere. Uh, depending upon how much you trust other people, you can consume it from someone else's ETH1 node. And that's that's a very different conversation. Um, but yes, you have to have that. You have to have it, it's like Ethereum 1 data as an oracle into your beacon node. Where you get that information and how much you trust it is up to you, uh, and maybe that's maybe it's reasonable to talk about the consequences of not having uh, proper data there, right? 
So like if you had yeah. your ETH1 data compromised in some way, shape or form, what could happen to your validator? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good point. I mean, and one of the biggest challenges we've had getting up and running has been people's ETH1 nodes. It's uh, uh, just still well, not a lot of information and a lot of resources. Yeah, that's exactly. Exactly. It's still not lightweight. And, um, and so especially around Genesis, people weren't in sync yet and so on. And, and, and also initially the amount of data, if you start up an, an Ethereum 2 client, it has to show up a lot of data in the, in the early moments from, you know, all, all the deposit contract data up to now out of the ETH1 node. And this proved to be a bit too much for some of the, uh, nodes we were using. So we had to dial back on the rate. We sucked information out of them just so they could, uh, stay responsive. But I think we're over that now. Um, the only thing you can't do if you can't, if you can't see the deposit contract via your ETH1 node is propose a block. So when you propose a block, you have to, it's mandatory in the protocol, include any pending deposits, uh, up to, I think, 16 deposits. And if you miss out any, if you don't, because you don't know they're there or you're too lazy, then you will, um, your block won't be valid. So that that's basically the only consequence is that, that whenever you propose a block, it won't be valid. You can still earn rewards through attestations. That's got no relationship with the ETH1 at all. Um, for purposes of right now, we want to talk about slashing, like slashing issues later. But if you get slashed, that's a harsher, harsher punishment to your validator. Um, we'll talk about how you get slashed later. But is it possible to be slashed by producing an invalid block because you have wrong or like malign data from F1? Do you want to go, Greg? <laughs> I, that's a good one. I'm going to say yes, but I almost want to go look up the spec and get back yeah. to you in like two yeah, minutes a, because I this is how I thought of that question until just now. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, to be honest, the reason why I'm going to say yes is because it's considered invalid. Um, and that means your block would be voted against on right from an attestation perspective. So I'm going to say yes, but you know what? Let me <laughs> mm. BRB. <laughs> okay, I guess in that, in that, in that time period, I think it's reasonable yeah. to start talking about, um, slashable events in the mm. network um and yeah. um, so um, like to pre preface propose, that, go ahead ben. proposing an invalid block is not a slashable offense so all you do is you lose your block reward now your block reward is is a decent reward i mean it's worth uh as much as in like eight attestations but it's um it's not um not a huge chunk if you if you miss it so uh, it's probably worth a bit more actually, but it's, it's not a massive loss if you miss it. So if you have invalid data, um, your block is, uh, considered invalid by the network and you lose your block reward, but there's no punishment for, for that. And certainly not slashing. If you propose two conflicting blocks at the same height, then you can be slashed. And that's what I wanted to get into. Um, it's been 10 days. There's already been quite a few slashes, more than I expected. Um, and I think, Based on the pre, like based on the information that I saw uh, the last time I checked, all of them or almost all of them are due to people running the same node multiple times. Right. Yeah. So there've been five events, unless there's been another one today. There's like um, four of them are individuals um, who had single nodes, and in in each case they were running two validators with the same set of keys or the same the same private key on two validators and uh, and have you know confessed to, to doing this and basically as a backup they wanted to have a high uptime if one of their validators went down they wanted to have the other on a, you know a hot standby so that it would fail over but actually the, the the result is that the these eventually these validators are contradicting to each other and that's a slashable offense and it's not so bad currently you get fined immediately 0.25 ETH um, you have some extra penalties, not very large, uh, so you probably lose about 0.3 or 0.4 of an ETH. But the big consequence is you're then kicked out as a validator. So, and your ETH is the remaining stake, 31.6 ETH or whatever, is then locked up until uh, we merge ETH1 and ETH2, which could be a year, year and a half, two years away. So it's then unproductive. 
So that's the main consequence. You don't lose a huge amount by getting slashed right now. We reduce the penalties for a few months, but uh, you are then locked into the system with unproductive ETH for the foreseeable future. I didn't realize that um, getting kicked out of the network currently kicks you out for two years. I, I thought right. that, um, that the that it was just for a period of time, mm. but that's when we're live. That's not right. So when each one and each two, right? So I yeah, think that's yeah. what people don't quite understand is that it's just phase zero. Like the yep. making chain yeah. isn't doing much other than what it's supposed to do, which is which is a dependent function upon the other phases. And so we have to make sure that this works appropriately and works well and provides incentive for people to do it. But the, but the ETH that lives on ETH2 is a one-way function as currently. And it's going to be a while until we finish the other phases of, of, of ETH2 before you can, you can have any utility whatsoever with the ETH associated with it. And so, right. like he's saying... Yeah, but, yeah, go ahead, Ben. Sorry. Yeah, just to finish off on the slashing, there, there were 10... Um, nodes slashed which belonged to a single uh, staking service um, who had done a sort of homebrew anti-slashing uh, solution and one of their nodes had got out of sync and they managed to um, miss the slashing protection. They didn't detect the condition and, and ended up uh, with 10 nodes being slashed. They pretty quickly turned off everything else and uh, fixed it before restarting. Yeah, and to, to <clears throat> just after looking at the spec, yeah, ben, Ben's accurate in the you know, as long as you're proposing what you think is accurate, right? Like you're going to be fine from a slashing condition. Slashing conditions are uh, the intent around you're trying to be malicious. I think that's probably the better way to like really describe it. It's like you're not going to get slashed because something just didn't work right. You know, from like you collecting data, you're going to get slashed because you tried to do something very, you tried to be malicious to the actual protocol. I think it's like think overwhelming, over, overwhelmingly provable that you've done something that's negative towards the network. Uh, uh, but it's interesting though, because as it, as it currently stands, this, this is mainly, I don't want to call it incompetence, but like bad DevOps practices, over optimization, um, lack of understanding of slash conditions, things like that. Like no one's actively trying to take over the network, but yeah. you're not going to get slashed unless uh, the network can prove that you've done something bad like that that can lead to a like a malicious act as opposed to just yeah. having incomplete information yeah uh, and, and and this is a point the network can't tell if you're being evil or incompetent it, it has no idea so we do have a concept of correlated activity if you see a lot of people simultaneously breaking the rules then the penalties are much higher because that looks like a coordinated attack which is going to be much more dangerous but odd one-off events are very lightly penalized um, for that reason. Yeah. I, I, I'd like to put this into perspective for some of the listeners. Um, um, I'm actually going to ask this to you, Corey. Um, with, so for those who are like thinking of, of running a validator, um, you know, understanding why you shouldn't be malicious, if we can put that into sort of monetary terms, um, for those, you know, unaware, right? Like, you need to stake 32 ETH, which is, you know, one ETH is sitting at today, as of today's value is like what? Um, six. I have no idea. I, don't, I never check prices. Five, <laughs> 560 USD. Um, so, you know, to put that in perspective, you're not gain like, if you get dropped from the network, the 32 ETH is going to sit in that deposit contract for the next two years roughly or longer, depending on how, how long um, phase zero takes. Um, and you will not be receiving any APY on that. So the, the 32 ETH would not be working for you at all. Um, and it would be simply locked. So it is in, so it, I guess, I guess maybe um, it would be good to talk a little bit about, it sounds like some of these, these people were trying to do optimizations or mitigation but they weren't, um, but they were, they were thinking it in a selfish terms rather than in a network terms. Um, and I think it would be, inter it would be good to kind of dive into like, how should someone be thinking about this? If they're thinking about op optimizations, it sounds like they should be thinking like, 
more simpler. You know, just make sure that it's not and, and not trying to overcomplicate it. My opinion. Yeah. Sorry, Ben. Sorry, Corey, go on. My opinion on what is currently the optimal way to run um, a validator at Beacon Node is to have dedicated hardware that has um, a few times the computational resources needed to run a Beacon Node, which is relatively light, right? Like if you like, think about a Nimbus, Nimbus Node, which is... Uh, like the, the lighter of resources on the network, like running on a Pi 4, you can. I don't recommend it. Um, I recommend something that's um, four cores, eight gigabytes of memory, maybe four, maybe four gigabytes at least, and a, and a quality quality amount of hard drive space. I think someone said okay. in, the, in our Node program, I, we're we're like running it like like the amount of consumption of hard drive space is not trivial so like running on like a raspberry pi 4 is not good right because uh those are usually run off of uh, flash memory which isn't, isn't isn't good memory it's not robust the main thing is you want to have something that's going to be online for a long period of time and stable and it's dedicated it always has a good internet connection and like you said earlier there's a good source for eth1 which, if you're going to run yourself, is a significant amount of more a significant amount more, more re, the computational resources to do. And what you're really trying to optimize, so just you run the Beacon Node software. You make sure that you have a good practice on how to update it, and that's going to be dependent upon the client software that you have. And it's usually going to be stop the node, like update the software in the background on it in a separate folder, not the same folder. Move the binary to where the your, your your scripts keep it, and if you don't understand these words, then we need better software practices to make it easier for more people to do. Which is, which kind of stands to like push the idea of like who should be running these things is the people who understand what I'm saying right now. Eventually, when we get better at this, we can broaden that. Uh, so you stop, you upgrade your software based on whatever updates you need to do that are critical. Stop the node and restart it. You'd never, and you, and you need very solid DevOps practices in terms of how you stop your node, how you upgrade it, how you start it. And that's just like, that's just running it. Cool. We have dedicated software that's running a piece of software that we know how to upgrade and it stays online all the time. Now, what you need to optimize for, and this is what I think the current, most of the current work is being done by the client teams, at least it is for us at Nimbus, is how do you monitor this thing? How do you know when you need to do software upgrades, what those software software upgrades entail, how do you know when you miss that attestation? How do you know when your number of peers isn't sufficient? Like all of these kind of metrics around what your node is doing and that you're doing the right thing in the right amount of time. What's your inclusion distance over a period of time, right? So like how fast does your attestation get 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 accepted by the network? All of these things you need to have a very quick way of understanding. And if things aren't meeting an acceptable criteria, you need to have a way to be alerted so you can address it appropriately. And kind of we said this earlier was um, like it's not immediately obvious like when an, like you can send an attestation but it didn't get accepted or something's wrong with it. And there's, there's kind of like subtle ways in which attestations aren't getting aren't being included optimally. And so like the monitoring part of all of this needs to be uh, what's being optimized. And that's that's not only a client side thing, but it's also a network side thing in terms of like, like you said earlier, uh, I think it was you, Greg, that like most of the people who are checking uh, on whether or not they're doing this appropriately is they're checking Beacon Chain, which is Beacon Chain spelled out, but dot .in instead of the full word. And which I want to add that is Etherscan's version of network history. Yeah. So that's, you know, way. like everyone has, everyone has different, viewpoints of the network mm -hmm. um if anyone's been around long enough to be doing trying to get into into uh um sales back in 2016 you know would know that you want to spam different nodes because it's different views of the network so in that same in that in that same vein like i think i think what 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 people are getting at is um is there is not one single source of truth. Um, it is a collection of sources of truth. 
and uh, no depends right it depends on where you're looking right because if you okay. look at the if you look at the aggregated source the blockchain itself that's a single source of truth it takes it takes a lot of individual sources of truth to get to that point and that's where like finality comes in right that's the whole like beauty of right. consensus is you have right. an emergent an emergent finality from a lot of individual perspectives right i mean finality okay there's there's finality sure but you still have um you still have to consider like it as a clock right if i'm running a if i'm running a um let's say i'm just running an eth1 node and we're comparing you know like my node compared to what um uh will agree with what is being said on either scan but there's still going to be slight timing variances there is it does it matter much for this definition probably not but ostensibly i still would believe that there is still a slight view of slight difference in view of the network yeah uh, what Corey said about finality is is key here so finality is a point at which a whole network agrees that it has a um an a, a consistent single point of truth view of the network. No, nobody deviates from that. Um, Ethereum one proof of work doesn't have finality. You've got some assurance that uh, nobody will ever come uh, along with a chain that's different from the one that you see, but it, it's never, you can never say never. In Ethereum two and in proof of stake in general, you can say before this point in time, we will never change the history of chain. Everybody has the same view of the history of the chain. And it will never change. And we achieve finality in ETH2 in about 12 minutes, which is not very ambitious. I mean, you can, uh, uh, if things are effectively final much quicker than that under most circumstances. But absolute finality is, is achieved in about 12 minutes. And anything before that, you can guarantee it, it's, you, you have the source of truth. So a definition as to what finality is and an implementation of that is actually new for ETH2 because we, defined at finality before based on what Bitcoin was doing. Um, and now there's a different idea of what finality is because we've learned that it's not necessarily fina- final. That's, that's interesting. That, so there's a, this is a longer, subtle conversation on the differences mm-hmm. of what um, consensus algorithms are running, whether it be traditional consensus or classical consensus. Nakamoto consensus or uh, variations of traditional consensus that include crypto economics, um, and what so, like, so, like Nakamoto consensus, which is standardly referred to as like uh, proof of work, is probabilistic has probabilistic finality, which means that over time you have a larger and larger prob- probability that a something won't be changed, and that's why you need to wait six blocks in Bitcoin or whatever it is, or this day to like to say like okay, this thing is good. But if you're buying a cup of coffee with Bitcoin, you don't really care if it's like the likelihood that it's overturned isn't that big of a deal. Um, traditional consensus is when the network or the, the, the people participating in consensus, validators in the point of F2, come to a decision, it's done. But with Casper FFG, it's a mixture of the two kind of. So you have what the, the concept of an epoch, which is somewhat probabilistic finality until the epoch is over and then it's snapped over it's final for the rest for the for the end of time uh and so like that's that's a i think a larger conversation in terms of like what it means to be final and the economic differences of probabilistic finality throughout an epoch and and the security around like as you move through an epoch and then when it's done which is a very a very subtle and complicated conversation Interesting thread for sure. Um, but yeah, maybe we can uh, kind of deviate a little from that on, on finality. But it sounds like um, overall the network is going well, um, apart from a few people who got slashed. And unfortunately now they there's like, what, 11 people in 10 days or 11 validators in 10 days that have each at least 32 ETH locked up for two plus years before they're allowed to potentially rejoin the network. Um, maybe that kind of leads into what the network is designed for, um, given, you know, 2020 has been kind of rough on people. Um, the, the design of the network is, um, is meant to, uh, outlast cataclysmic events. What does that mean? Greg, that's you. 
Always with the tough ones, eh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like, as we talked about, I mean, from a catastrophic standpoint, you know, we could lose, someone could, like, you know, we could lose, and this gets into a larger conversation about how, like, the actual web is technically wired up from, like, a sea cable perspective, but, like, let's say, like, the connection from, like, North America to Europe gets cut, right, and we lose that ability to communicate with those people, and now we have to route ourselves through, like, Asia to get to Europe, right, and that's how the North American connection to Europe just ends up happening. Um, like we discussed, it's, like, not even the penalties that are going to be that bad, right, and it's, like, we, it, the protocol itself is designed to be resilient to the idea of, like, mass outages to some degree, obviously, unless our threshold drops, where, like, we literally don't have enough validators to kind of push the chain forward, which I think we saw in one of the test nets, I just can't remember which one, um, or a bunch of the validators just stop validating. Um, so I think it's been designed quite well for like those type of like D day scenario, like day zero kind of scenarios and whatnot. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's like to see that type of like, to see like a catastrophic situation where we lose that much of the network would be, would be interesting, <laughs> you know? And I think it's been designed well and it, yeah, it, it's referred to as the World War Three scenario in um, in some of the documents, uh, and the the idea is that all all the validators' votes are weighted by their their stake, and so if validators go offline, and so my my view sitting here in the UK, if I if I can't see half the world's validators, they suddenly disappear from view. I'm on a much smaller network, and half the, half the validators are missing. In those circumstances, I can't achieve finality. There are not enough validators alive out of the whole set that I know should be there to agree on the state of the, the, the chain. Um, so I can progress the chain. I mean, if half the validators are there, we'll make on average blocks every, every other slot. So we can still make progress, but we can't achieve this finality, which is desirable. And so in those circumstances, we have what we call the uh, quadratic leak. Um, whereby increasingly the validators who don't show up, their balances, in my view of the world, are decreased and decreased and decreased. And eventually they get down to around 16 Ether from 32 and they're kicked out of the uh, of my local network. So uh, that takes um, normally two to three weeks. We've relaxed that, so it would be about six weeks uh, plus now, just in case of any trouble. And the idea is that... It, when enough have been kicked out, then I now, we now have enough local validators. The network's small enough. It's, it's just the ones that are, that I can reach, uh, that I have my own, um, network. I've basically cut off the rest of the world, uh, and have a separate network and we can, we can progress and start finalizing again. And after that, the, the different networks, you know, presumably there's one somewhere in China or whatever that's, you know, separated from mine after three weeks, uh, and they'll never, it's essentially a hard fork. They'll, they'll never be reconciled. So there are, you know, three plus weeks to fix any problems. But after that time, we prioritize regaining finality and making the uh, the network safe again. Can we talk about that? Actually, that's probably a good point because mm-hmm. it's been brought up a few times. Let's talk about the difference between like a voluntary exit and getting kicked off the network and like what that really means. Because it's been brought up like, oh, your 32 is like, you know, you got to wait a while. Um you know, so like, let's maybe Ben, if you want to touch on that, it's like the idea of like topping up and also like how much time you really have, right? Before you forcefully get kicked off versus mm-hmm. like wanting to just like withdraw. Yeah, the, I mean, there are three ways to exit. One is to be slashed, in which case is involuntary. One is to neglect your validator, um, so it's not running, and eventually you will get down to sixteen Eve. And if the rest of the network's functioning, that's going to take um, three, four years, <laughs> and uh, uh, you'll eventually um, drop below the threshold. Um, and then there's voluntary exit, whereby I say I no longer wish to be participating in the network, uh, and you can exit. You join a queue, um, but you know, usually we'd expect the queue to be short, so four validators can exit every six uh, minutes. Uh, and then you've got a short period of time. I can't remember exactly how, how much, a couple of days. And then in principle, you can withdraw your ETH after that. However, we have no mechanism to do that until we've done this, this merge of ETH1 and ETH2. Um, and, yeah, but at that point you could exit and you could rejoin. Um, 
we should talk about this this sort of merge and what comes next. I mean, we've sort of had this two years before anyone can with, withdraw anything. Um, I hope it's going to be shorter than that. So the initial roadmap, we, we started a couple of years ago, the very linear roadmap where we do phase zero, we do phase one, which is sharding, we do phase two, which is this sort of abstract execution engine sort of concept. And then we implement ETH1 on top of one of these abstract execution engines. And it was sort of pure and clean and long and, and had this end goal of merging ETH1 and ETH2. But the pressure is on, honestly, to, to do the merge earlier and get ETH1 off proof of work and onto proof of stake and also to, to uh, take advantage of the scalability. So gradually that merge has kind of moved forward in the roadmap. So it was moved to phase 1.5, which is sort of after sharding, but before execution engines. And now we're looking at um, a proposal called executable beacon chain, where we actually don't even, we don't even have to wait for sharding to bring Ethereum 1 into Ethereum 2. We put ETH1 straight into the beacon chain. We can do that before we even have shards. We could, uh, um, uh, one of my colleagues is building a demo of this right now, uh, and it's not technically that complex. There are a few loose ends to, to tie up. So it may be much quicker to uh, get ETH1 into ETH2 and off proof of work. Um, and at that point, people's validator balances, when they exit, you'll be able to bring them back into the ETH1 that we all know and love and uh, and uh, can, can free them and use them. Yeah, that brings up a really good point too, right? Because for the last two, three years, everybody's been seeing ETH2 development. It's just the beacon chain, right? It's like we have all these other things. And if you put in, if you try to put on a time scale, everyone's going to Gantt chart and be like, well, you took this long and now it's going to take this long. It's going to take this long. We're looking at nine years, right? It's like what, you know, if you were to put it in front of like a product, you know, manager, that has no idea. They're like, this is crazy. But I think the real key thing here is to also remember, like, you know, the beacon chain and what we've done. And I think Danny said this really well um, at CSCon at you know, our event we held last week, which was like, listen, like we spent this long because we have to get the consensus algorithm from ETH1 and recreate a new one. And basically where the beacon chain sole purpose is to prove that this consensus algorithm works and we can iterate really rapidly at this point. And, you know, it's like get something into production and now we can start shipping quick. I think that's like something that, you know, classical web two development will also like appreciate. It's like once you get that first base layer, it's like now we can start iterating on features and stuff. Right. And like, for instance, in our case, um, one of our priorities is light clients because we want to be able to essentially say like your MetaMask no longer needs to leverage like an inferior like service. And now you can just run a light client, um, which is, you know, why we went browser first. And our team's already we've been prototyping that, you know, like the, the, the steps needed from the beacon chain. And we're already like full steam ahead getting going forward on like time to actually start working on that because everybody's already got like phase one, some phase one components ready, you know, and they're, you know, working on it. And that's where. You know, we're going to start seeing light clients come out in phase one, which is like, here's a whole new usability layer, right? And then, you know, it's not just shards. It's like we start seeing a lot of the, like, ecosystem support things coming into play. Um, And that's where we're going to see a lot of, like, more rapid development. I I could see phase one happening really, like, parts of phase one happening, like, well within the next six months, in which case we're really far ahead to, like, see that ETH1 merger get so much closer. I think that's a super undervalued appreciation of like why the beacon chain is really important because like we got the hard stuff done (laughs) you know it's like now we can just put features it's like a transfer yeah we can do transfers now like might not want to because of some edge cases but at least like we have the fundamentals to get it done i did not realize that um the first of all that eth1 merger had moved up in the timeline um i was more aware of you know maybe it's going to be um on a ghost chain like like a like a plasma shard or a plasma a contract or you know maybe it would be its own shard or whatever later um but this this early merger that's really that's actually really interesting um uh we're kind of coming up a little bit to time um so I'll, I'll kind of uh give it back to Corey but before I do I just wanted to say that I'm looking at uh beacon scan right now and there is currently uh, 912, uh, thousand plus ETH eligible ether to vote on attestations, which means that is, I think that's the same amount as, as how much is, is, is staked. So we're, 
just under um, a million ether uh, staked, which I think, you know, given the price of ether right now is, I think, I think we would, that is almost, if not just at a billion dollars USD worth of locked value um, on the, <clears throat> um, for this, like this, this phase zero. So that's, so this, you know, for this, you know, for the fact that we're iterating, you, you know, it sounds like everything's going to be able to iterate really quick because the difficult part was happening, uh, has already happened. That's a lot of confidence, um, that the, that, uh, that ETH2 is not only, well, we know it's happening, but it's, it's, it's happening. And that's really exciting. Um, especially for those of us who've been watching Sid for a long time to see, to see that is, um, is really, really cool. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and there's a two-week queue to get in. There's another 300 um, uh, K ETH um, queued up to to join, and we'll join over. So if you stake today, you won't actually become live as a validator for over two weeks now because uh, uh, of all the stakes that are ahead of you in the queue. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it's awesome. I mean, when the deposit contract was announced things were very slow for the first couple of weeks and uh, journalists were contacting me saying what are you going to do are you going to lower the thresholds are you going to delay and whatever and I was like no no it'll be fine it'll be fine but it got a, yeah it got a bit tense at the weekend beforehand but then suddenly it, it just went vertical the deposits in the contract and it's it's been the voter confidence has been awesome to see yeah yeah very uh, delighted Something super off top, kind of off topic that I just noticed is like if you actually look at the year APY and you like spy validator, you actually notice that the person who's made the most right now has produced only five blocks. The most has been 10. And actually, they actually have two slashing conditions that they've triggered, which is really interesting from an economic standpoint. Right. They've picked up slashings, uh, other validators getting slashed and you get a, a, a decent chunky reward for including slashings reports in, in a block. So yeah, yeah, that would be where a good part of the income's from. Oh, okay. I was looking at it as they got slashed. Ah. So we're running out of time and, uh, like to, to, to be respectful of, of Jay and her time, uh, I'd like to try and wrap up a little bit here. Greg, do you have anything, uh, quick to say to wrap up the episode? Anything you want to? tell anyone just thank anyone shout outs to whoever you like i don't care yeah my biggest one is honestly i've been showing this for like two years now and you brought up it's like make sure you're planning your hardware accordingly you know phase one and phase two are going to get scary um you know devcon last year we talked about you know tens of gigs of data you know needing to be stored or you know in a given week or two and it's definitely something to consider and you know, if you do want to run that Raspberry Pi, highly suggest considering only the validator on it and connecting it directly to where your beacon node is set up. And, you know, like you said, you know, we got to plan accordingly. And not only do you have to know about your software upgrade pass, but you have to also know about your hardware upgrade pass. You know, how are you? it's something to start practicing probably in the new year is, hey, if I need to expand to 32 RAM for my 8 gigs of RAM, how am I going to do it? And how am I going to do it so I don't get slashed with a double, you know, a double validator situation? Um, so definitely something to consider for a lot of people is, knowing how to do software upgrades and also knowing how to do hardware upgrades because um, that's something you want to do probably in 24 hours. You know, you don't want to leak too hard. And check out Lodestar for some awesome dev tooling and we're being used everywhere and, you know, as people are starting to use it. We also have a Web3.js has our Eek2 support coming out probably this week or next week. And so you'll be able to, you know, web, install Web3.js and query some stuff from the Beacon Note if you want to have that JavaScript uh, experience that you know. Awesome. Ben, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I like to reflect on the journey uh, at times like this. Um, it's been incredible. A lot of people said it couldn't be done. We've done this in perhaps the hardest way possible. We've kept it permissionless. We kept it open. We have kept it decentralized. I'm talking about the protocol development. All comers are welcome. We take ideas from everywhere. Um, we don't have a dictator for life. Um you know, Danny Ryan is close, but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, and I think it has served us well. It's been hard, um, and bumpy and there've been a lot of re, we've done everything in the open, right? A lot of protocols are retreated to a closed room, a lab and have done their thing out of the public glare and, and haven't really produced a lot. We've done this all in the open and everyone's seen all the missteps and everything, but we've delivered this beacon chain thing and I am deeply proud. 
Um, it's just the beginning. I like to call it proof of proof of stake at this point. But um, we've got a lot, long way to go. But I'm more confident than ever that we will deliver all of ETH2 uh, in a timely fashion. Awesome. Thank you. Jay? Um, I mean, it's been uh, a pleasure just, you know, being there kind of on the sidelines. And then, of course, um, you know, being with uh, with Quantstamp, being able to work with uh, a lot of great um a lot of great groups and of course Teku as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, it is crazy that we're here. Um, huge congratulations to the community, like just so much work, huge congratulations to all the teams. Um, and yeah, the, I mean, this is, this is, this is phase zero, right? So, um, still a long way to go. Um, and I guess, uh, as always, shill or be shilled, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's a t-shirt that I've ever, I've ever heard one. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you all for joining us. I appreciate you kind of helping me uh, share kind of the, the wisdom that we've learned in the process of trying to deliver this thing, what we've, what we've gained from running it, building it. Um, I, it's it's very clear that we're all very proud of the work that has been done by the like plethora of people that have that have contributed to it. But there's still quite a bit of work to do and a quite a bit of education to give for those who'd like to participate. So we'll keep trying to do this. Um, for those who are listening or watching for the first time on hashing it out, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. The production will get better, but the conversation will always be good. And uh, see you next time, guys. Thanks. <laughs>